So we're continuing our series in the book of Ecclesiastes. If you recall back to Momentum, you'll remember that one of those messages had to deal with the dangers of materialism. The dangers of materialism. And the author of Ecclesiastes is going to pick up on that very same theme in chapter 5, verses, uh, starting in verse 10. But before we get there, I want to I reference something that I, I read years ago. I've probably shared it in a previous sermon. But Tim Keller did a series on the seven deadly sins many years ago. And when he got to the sin of greed, he got to the sin of greed, he used this illustration. It really wasn't an illustration, it's just an anecdotal story. He said he'd been pastor for 30 years, and this was probably 15, 20 years ago, but he had been pastor for many years and he heard every kind of confession. He had numerous people make appointments with him and say, pastor, I've fallen in adultery. Pastor, I've, I've, I'm tied up into pornography. Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with alcoholism. Pastor, I am bitter and I can't forgive this person who hurt me. So any and all conceivable manners of sin and disappointment, he had heard everything. But he had said, I've never to this day had anyone schedule an appointment with me and tell me, Pastor, I'm struggling with greed. Let that sink in just for a minute. I've been a pastor since 1998, and I've had the same type of situations where I've heard every confession that you can possibly imagine. I've never met with anyone who said, I am just struggling with greed. I'm struggling with materialism. So this is the biggest problem no one has. It is the biggest problem that no one has. And so as you listen to this text and as you read the scriptures and you hear the word preached, try to think of someone you know who might have this problem because obviously you and I don't, but maybe there might be someone who does and you can help them. Now that's being very facetious, being very sarcastic. There's a reason that, it, that it, it, we don't see it in ourselves. We can always see it in somebody else, but we never see it in ourselves. It's insidious. It hides. And it's, uh, it's something that needs to be brought out by the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal it. And only the Holy Spirit can give us a solution for it. So we're going to cover four things this morning. We're going to see, first of all, the vanity of wealth. The vanity of wealth and possessions. Verses 8 through 17. We're going to see, on the contrast to that, uh, the joy of contentment. The joy that the Lord gives when, when we're content. And then we're also going to see the problem with contentment. Contentment would be great if we could have it, but we don't. So he's going to talk about why contentment is so difficult or elusive. And then we're going to look to the gospel and see where contentment actually comes from. The secrets to contentment. So that's where we're headed. So open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 10. Father, we thank you for the word of God. As Steve mentioned uh, before the last song, uh, it is God-breathed, useful for reproof, training, uh, building us up that we might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And Father, we need your spirit to open our eyes and open our hearts up as we study a subject which truthfully nobody thinks they have an issue with. But it's a subject that you speak uh, to with with many, many, many scriptures, both Old and New Testament. So Spirit, speak to our hearts, and, and not just the, the place where we're convicted, but also where we see hope through the person and the work of Jesus Christ that we might be encouraged, that we might learn true contentment, and that we might receive joy that comes from that. Help me to preach and teach in such a way that Jesus is honored, that he is glorified, and uh, we just pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Here we go, verse 10. The author says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. Remember, just co collectively here, what we're looking at is the author of Ecclesiastes is trying to, he's, he's, he's doing a thought experiment, if you will. He's trying to figure out what the meaning of life is under the sun. He uses this phrase 35 times. So if you could try to squeeze meaning out of anything and everything you can do or see under the sun, that is things which are not transcendent, 
uh, not beyond creation, but everything that you can feel and touch. And he tries wealth as well. He's already talked about pleasure, what he uses wealth for in chapter two, but now he talks about wealth itself. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor will he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. You see this also in the New Testament quite a bit. This is Paul speaking in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Sounds very fam- similar to Ecclesiastes 5.10. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away and from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. First of all, notice that he does not say that money is the root of all evil. Money is not the root of all evil. Money is a neutral commodity. It's just what you use to buy things. Okay? Money is not moral. It's not pro, it's not evil, it's not good, it's not bad, it's just stuff. All right? So, but the love of money, that's a problem. Love of money deals with the heart of the individual who possesses it or doesn't possess it but wants it. That is a heart issue, it's not a money issue. In this case, he who, both of these, Old and New Testament, the problem is not the money, the problem is the love of money. He who loves money will not be satisfied. So that begs the question, what does it mean to love money? Most people do not believe they love money. Now, you could talk to any number of individuals and they will say, oh, I really struggle with lust, I really struggle with gluttony, I really struggle with this. They can tell you that I have an inor- you have an inordinate desire for this, that, and the other thing, but nobody ever thinks they have a, a lust for money or a love for money. And, and Jesus uh, poignantly brings this to, uh, his teaching to, to a head here when he explains what does it mean to love money. He says, nobody can serve two masters. For he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. So in Jesus' mind, to love money means to serve money. Now, that doesn't really make sense, though. I mean, you don't serve money. No, you serve to get money. And why do you get money? What do you want it for? To purchase what you believe will give you happiness. Now, there's, two, there's, two, there's a spectrum here when, in terms of money. There's those who are spenders. They believe that the key to meaning in life is to use money to spend it to get it. Now, that would be an example of, like, say, the prodigal son. You familiar with the prodigal son? The prodigal son comes to his father and says, Father, give me my inheritance. In other words, Dad, I wish you were dead now so I could have the the estate. And his father, hurt by that, gives him his share of the inheritance, and what does the prodigal son do? Goes off to a far-off country and blows it all. He just starts spending money. Why? Because he believes that the meaning to life is pleasure, by which he's going to use money to get it, right? So, and that's meaningless. That's meaningless. He doesn't necessarily love money, but he serves money. He uses money to get what he loves. The other extreme is the rich fool in in Luke 12 who tears down his barns and builds bigger barns so he can store more. In other words, this is a hoarder. This is a saver. He believes that money is security. He's not looking for pleasure. He's looking for security. He's looking for stability. Kind of a different personality than the prodigal son. But nonetheless, both of them have an issue with the love of money. Now, what does he contrast the love of money with here? here in, in, in uh, verse 24 in chapter 5 of Matthew. The love of God. You can't love both. In other words, this person is looking for what they're using money for to validate their existence. That's where they're hoping to find joy. They're hoping to find meaning in that. And Jesus is saying, you can't have it both ways. You cannot have it both ways. So the love of money is not just to simply look at cash and go, oh, you're so beautiful. It's to look at cash or to look at savings or to look at a credit card and say, this is my ticket. This is my ticket to happiness. It's through this that I'm going to achieve happiness and meaning. Jesus says you just can't do it. You can't do it. But we'll try. So let's look at what happens when we do. First of all, verse 10, the first cost of loving money, there's four different costs we're going to look at. Cost number one is you will forfeit contentment. You'll never have contentment. 
He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. So I want to speak to those of you who are currently working. Uh, you're currently working. So there's a number of students here. You're in school so that you can get a job, so that you can work, and so forth and so on. So I want you to think back to a time when you, your income was fairly small. And for some of you, it's like, that's right now. I have no income. I'm a student. Or I just graduated, and I just got a job, and it's really small. Do you, do you remember when you thought, if I had more money, I could get this luxury? Do you remember that? Okay, so think about what that luxury is. Or was. Okay, well then you, your, your, your income gradually increased over time. Over time. So you don't make the same amount. You have greater income potential now when you're 40 or 50 than you did when you were 20. And you actually purchase some of those things which you didn't have, which were luxuries back then, right? Has anybody noticed this phenomenon that luxuries 20 years ago are now necessities? Anybody? Or is it just me? Luxuries 20 years ago are now necessities we could not do without. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. When you love money, you will never have enough. You will never have enough. Ed Welch, biblical counselor and author, speaking on addiction, not speaking about money, but you'll see how it applies. He says, with each indulgence, we paradoxically feel less and less satisfied. While we are persuaded that the object of our desires is the only thing that can fill us, money works the same way. We believe that if I had more, I would be satisfied. And then we get more, and we are not satisfied. That's what the author of Ecclesiastes is speaking of. We are on a never-ending cycle of trying to be filled and, and acquiring more, and it just doesn't fill us. So you forfeit commitment when you love money. Here's something else you do gain, and that is anxiety. Increased anxiety. When goods increase, they increase. Who eat them? And what advantage has the owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of the laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. What he's saying here is when you don't have much, you don't worry about losing it. But when you acquire much and you have more responsibilities, now all of a sudden the mind kicks into overdrive and you begin to thinking about all the different scenarios that could happen that could destroy your nest egg. Think, and then he gives a, 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 a proverb, sweet is the sleep of a laborer. And compared to the person who is not a laborer, but maybe an owner. Think of this in terms of construction. You have a laborer, a person who swings a hammer. He's got a tool belt and he works a blue collar job. She works a blue collar job and they're tired and they've used their muscles, their back, their brains, and they've just, they've exhausted themselves at the end of the day. But when they punch out because they are paid an hourly wage, when they punch out, they cease to think about the job. And now they think about their family, they think about whatever else is going on in their life, and when, when they hit, the head hits the pillow, they're tired, and they just go to sleep. Now contrast that with the contractor or the, the, the person who runs the construction firm who is taking out huge loans to finance various building uh, enterprises. He's got a giant payroll, or she's got a giant payroll. There's lots of, lots of people to pay. There's lots of responsibilities. There's subcontractors that have to, uh, they have to align when they're going to come in, and they have to get their job done. And when they go home, their minds don't shut off. Now they're concerned about, will this spec home actually sell? Will I have to eat what I put into it financially. In other words, I could lose all of this in a second. If the interest rates go up and the balloon loan that I've signed for this, which, which comes to term at the end of five, five years and then it goes up and I haven't paid all that off, I could be sunk. The laborer is not thinking about such things. Tired, but not worried. That's just an everyday occurrence. Just an everyday occurrence. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, how many of you worry about finances? You're lying in bed and you're worried about bills. Anybody? 
Lots of you, sure. That's what he's talking about. Your necessities or your luxuries have now become necessities and you've increased your standard of living as your, as your income potential goes up and, and the margin, never, it never, there's never, there's never enough. That's the point. And now that you have more, you have more debt, you have more assets, you have more responsibilities, so the increase, the worries increase. So you got that going for you. So you got that going for you. That's the second cost of loving money. Third cost is lost opportunity. Let's take a look. There's a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is the father of a son, but has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, so shall he go again. Naked as he came, he shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. In this case, what the author is doing here, he's like, take this scenario. You have an individual who, who uh, it, it, he, he, he collected all of these resources. He collected all of these resources and he was not a spender. This is the Luke 12 guy. This is the guy who tears down the, the one barn to build a bigger one. So he's got all of this stuff and he accumulates it, according to the scripture here, to his own hurt, to his own hurt, because he loses it in a bad venture. You remember back in 2008 when the economy tanked and everybody's retirement went poof? Think of that. Think of that. Or something similar. It, this isn't necessarily because he did something wrong. It just happens. You realize that if you own a business, things could go south, not necessarily because you're a poor business person or your, your, your 401k could be drained in an instant, not because you did anything wrong. It just happens. So to his own hurt, and not just his hurt, but also his sons, his families, they were hurt by this. And he is a father to a son, but he has nothing in his hand. In other words, he has nothing. To, so he's toiled and toiled and toiled. All of that income, all of that, all those resources could have been used to bless his family, could have been used to bless his community, could have been used to advance the kingdom of God. And instead, poof, it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. And it, it, it can't do anybody any good now that it's gone. This is the rich young fool, or the rich, the rich fool who, who says to himself, I'll just tear down my barns, I'll build bigger ones, and, and then, and it says literally, and I'll say to myself, eat, drink, and be merry. And Jesus says, you fool, don't you realize that you're, you'll give an account for your life this very night? And his wealth gained him nothing. It just sat there. It didn't help anybody. To his own hurt, to his own hurt. How many, by the way, this is not stating that retirement's bad. Okay, I, I put away money for a retirement. It's not a lot, but I, I, have, I have a retirement account. But how many of you believe and are looking forward to the day that you retire and you're, you're building this nest egg, build, and you think to yourself, then, 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 when I am to that point and I have acquired this much income, then I can start living. You don't know if you're going to be here to, by the end of today. Your life could be decalled from you right now. And then all of that retirement, which is all saved away, who will it bless? That's the point of this, this little, little section here in Ecclesiastes. Use it or lose it because you can't take it with you. That's the principle. That's what he says in verse 15. You can't take it with you. Who doesn't know this? Is there anybody here who's not aware that you can't take it with you? And yet, many people in our culture, in our context, live as if, oh, I'm taking it with me. <laughs> no, you won't. You know what? If you, if you die with, with millions of dollars in an estate and you have multiple children, there's a good chance that it will destroy the relationships between your, your, uh, your children. Especially if, well, even if you do divvy it up, they'll, they'll fight over it. Are you, are you've heard stories? So not only do you, you, you hoard it and not spend it to your own hurt, you then hurt the ones you pass it on to. They would be better off if you died with nothing, so now they would have nothing to fight over. It's, it's sick what money does to people. But it is what it is, right? And here's the last thing. 
So we lose contentment, we gain worry, we lose opportunity, and we lose joy. Verse 17, moreover, all his days he eats in darkness and in much vexation and sickness and anger. There's something that happens to a person gradually over time when they focus on, 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 on money or that which money can buy as their source of hope. They become more inwardly focused. More inwardly focused. You familiar with the Christmas Carol, Scrooge? Okay. Early on as a young man, he had a heart. And then his heart was hurt. And then he became more and more and more inwardly focused until literally... All his days he eats in darkness. That's exactly what Scrooge is doing. He is eating in darkness to save money because he doesn't want to turn the lights up because he'll save more money. He eats in, in vexation and sickness and anger. He's a bitter old man. You familiar with uh, It's a Wonderful Life? What is George Bailey called Mr. Potter? You're a warped, frustrated old man. It's Scrooge personified in our century. You know people like that. They, and, and they're not happy unless they have more. And then when they get more, they're still not happy because they realize there's something they don't possess. And they feel that if they could get that, then they'd be happy. But it's, not, it's a lie. It never happens. And so they just get more bitter and more bitter and more bitter and are vexed in their own souls. So now he contrasts that with contentment. Behold, I've seen what is good. There is something good. And fitting, and that's to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil which one toils under the sun. In the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his, what's that word? Lot. It means something which has been given to us. It's what, it's, it's the hand you've been dealt, so to speak. That's your lot. Keep reading. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and, and accepts his, there it is again, his lot, the hand that he's been dealt, and rejoices in his toll, this is a gift from God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with the joy of his heart. Back it up to verse, uh, actually verse 18, you see something repeated. God has given, God has given. Verse 19, God has given wealth. God has given the gift of God. What, what, what do you notice here? Who's the giver? Who's the giver? Okay, he's the giver. What's, what are the gifts here? Wealth. He gives wealth, but he also gives the power to enjoy. The power to enjoy. And, and you see that in the, when the person is, I, I ha here's what I have, and I'm, I'm happy with the giver who has given me these gifts. That's where contentment comes from. When, when you find your meaning and you find your joy, in your relationship with the giver, the gifts have a context. They're neither good nor bad, but they remind you that there is a giver and, you, and, that, love, and that giver loves you. And so when you're accepting what you have, you can focus on your thankfulness to the giver and you can be content. And here's, what, here's the result of that, verse 20. And he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Now, does that, is he saying that this person never suffers? No, he's not saying that this person never suffers. He's saying that he's not, those, those periods of suffering are, are, are turned right around with thankfulness for what they have. Yes, I am suffering now. Yes, the economy took a downturn. Yes, I lost this business venture. Yes, I don't have as much as, as, as the Joneses who left, ne live next door. Yes, all of those things are true, but my father is good. He's a good, good father and he gives good gifts. And I have my life. And I have, I have all of these things that God has given me, which are here today and gone tomorrow. But for now, I can enjoy them. Because the focus here is on the giver of the gifts, not the gifts themselves. Does that make sense? So here's, here's, the, here's the thing. The problem with contentment. When the focus is on the gift, contentment is not possible. So here, here's, here's what we could do. We're not going to do this, but we could do it. We could just close in prayer right now. And here's what this would mean. If I close in prayer right now, the message would be, don't be greedy, be content. Don't covet, be content. Ready? Break. How many of you know that it's better to be content 
than to covet. Just a show of hands. Okay, most of you, and those that didn't raise your hands are just the rebellious people that are like, anytime you ask me to raise my hand, I never will. So there, <laughs> that's fine. But I know you know, we all know, this is not rocket science. To be covetous is not to be content. And we know that a, a, internally, to, a state of contentment is good, it's better. And so for me to just tell you, just go be content now. That would be a true statement, but it would, be, it would be frustrating because you wouldn't be able to. You wouldn't, there's something wrong. There's a reason we can't be content. And he addresses it in chapter six, verse one. There's an evil. There's something else I see under the sun. There's an evil that I've seen under the sun and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing he desires. Yet God does not give him the power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. It's vanity. It's grievous evil. Grievous evil. Some commentators say you could translate grievous evil. It makes me sick. It turns my stomach. It just upsets me so much it causes me to be physically ill. So God's still the giver here. Do you see that? So what does God give the person here? What's this text say? What does he give them? Everything he desires, everything he wants. But what does he not give them? The power to enjoy them. Here's what's going on. The reason contentment is so elusive is that what we want is what the problem is. You, if you look for contentment in the gifts themselves, by definition, you love the gifts more than the giver. Go back to Matthew 6, 24. This is what Jesus is talking about. You can't love, can't serve both God and mammon. You can't, you can't have your focus on the gifts and the giver at the same time. It's not saying the gifts are bad. The things, whatever he desired, he got, and yet, what, he, what didn't he have? He didn't have the power to enjoy them. That is a universal law as consistent as the law of gravity. When you focus on the gifts that the giver gives, and you say, this is what I'm staking my hope on, I guarantee you, you will never be content. It's not possible. It's not possible. You say, well, I'll be the first. No, you won't. You will be a fool. You will not be the first. You will be one in a long line of human beings who get to the end in anger and vexation and darkness and realize before, when it's too late that you, like the rich fool, were just waiting, and waiting, for, waiting for the end. It's vanity. It's vanity. Keep reading here. It won't be on the PowerPoint, but verses three through six. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life good things, he also has no burial. I say that a stillborn child is better off than he is. Here's what he says. Listen, it would be better if you weren't born than to be born and focus on the gifts and never be content. A stillborn child is better off than the person who's materialistic. That's an indictment on our culture because our, our culture runs on materialism. Do you know what marketing is? It's helping people covet. That's what advertising does. I'm not saying advertising is wrong. You want to make your product aware so people know that if they have a need, they can get it. But the, the end game of, 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 of good advertising, Super Bowl ads, is to cause you to desire something you didn't need in the first place. So that, that luxury then becomes a necessity. You, you get the picture, right? You get the picture. And, and Solomon says a stillborn child would be better off. Because at least they won't ever be disappointed. They don't know any better. Verse seven and nine. All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite's never satisfied. 
When he says all the toil is for a man's mouth, what he's saying is when we work, we work to attain something we desire. But we're never satisfied. So here's the question, what do you desire? What do you think if you had it or you had more of it or if you just keep what you got, that's the key to happiness? What is that? For some of you, probably for most of you, it's not the accumulation of money per se. It's what you hope money will get you. Security, comfort, more stuff, status. How many of you don't sleep well at night because of finances? Anybody? How many of you are working hard just to stay ahead of the bill collectors? How many of you are living beyond your, your means and you're racking up debt? How many of you think that if you could just get more, you would truly be happy at that point? How many of you are sick and tired of the debt spiral? How many of you look at, 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 at Jesus' statement to, to not be anxious and, and just think, yeah, if ever? If we end right now, it's kind of hopeless because you're like, yeah, I'm stuck. That's me. I don't know what to do. There is a secret to contentment. It's not found in Ecclesiastes. Philippians chapter four, Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Little note about Philippians. Philippians, this is a support letter. It's from a missionary. Paul's a missionary and he's writing this church in Philippi. And in chapter one, he thanks them for their partnership with him in the gospel. And in chapter four, he tells them, I'm not currently in any need, but he goes on to say in, in verse 14, but if the Lord prompts you to give, that'd be great, essentially. So this is a support letter. And here he says, I'm not saying that I'm in need. By the way, he says, I'm not writing you because I need money. I don't. I don't. I just want you to know how thankful I am. He says, for I have learned in whatever situation I'm in to be content. That word content here, it means to be full. It means to be satiated. It, it means to, uh, to be satisfied at a soul level. At a soul level. Now, Paul is saying, I, I've, in whatever situation, so his, his fullness, spiritually speaking, or physically speaking, is not dependent upon his circumstances. What is it dependent upon? Let's take a look. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In every circumstance, I've learned the secret. There's a secret here of facing plenty and hunger. So there's been times in Paul's life where he has had an abundance. There's also been times in Paul's life where he's had nothing but the clothes on his back and sometimes he was stripped of those when he was stripped and beaten and left naked and left for dead on the side of the road. So there's times when he's had an excess, a surplus, and there's been times where he's literally had nothing. And what he's saying here is that I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And what's the secret? If, you're, if you were in, of a, the Buddhist faith, the secret is to cease to desire. Just stop wanting. That's not going to happen. The secret is to switch the focus of your desire. What's verse 13 say? He gives you the secret right here. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What's he saying? He's saying, my focus is the giver of the gifts, not the gifts themselves. Because when my desire is to, to bask in the, in, the, in the relationship that I, I have with the Father through the Son and to see the Son glorified and to experience that joy that he gives me by being rightly related to, to the Father through the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit, I know that whether or not I have much or have nothing, 
I am truly and deeply loved and I find my significance in my relationship with my father. And that can't be taken from me. So I'm not worried about whether I lose this, that, or the other thing. I'm not worried about if I never attain what I think will bring other people happiness. I have Christ and that's all I need. That's all I need. Jesus says, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Rest is synonymous with contentment. Anybody have a problem resting? Jesus is saying, if you come to me, take my yoke upon you. My burden is light. I do the heavy lifting and I will supply you. That's why right after he says that you can't serve both God and money, he says, therefore, don't be anxious about anything. Don't worry about what you're gonna eat, what you're gonna drink, where you're gonna sleep, or what you're gonna wear. The pagans run after these things. And I, look at the birds. Look at the, the lilies of the field. My father supplies them and how much more valuable are you? He says, therefore, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and God will add all these things unto you. In other words, flip it. Focus on him and the gifts will be given. Focus on the gifts, you'll never be content. You'll never be content. Man, this is a hard message. It's not hard to preach, it's hard to buy because we don't buy it. I mean, intellectually we do. Yeah, yeah, that's true, preacher, that's true. I ain't buying it because there's stuff I gotta buy. And when I buy those things, then I'll be happy. And you know it's a lie. You know it's a lie. Ultimately, we will never be convinced until we see the value of the cross, what Jesus bought on our behalf. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. He says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. Do you understand that the giver of all gifts wants to give you everything? Do you understand that by virtue of your relationship with Christ, you are an heir with Jesus of everything? You may have nothing, not a penny to your name, but in Christ, you are more wealthy than Solomon ever hoped to be. In Jesus Christ, you are an adopted child beloved by the Father. And he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You may lose everything. Everything you own, but you will never lose the union that you have with the king of the universe. You can't lose that. And Paul knew it. And that's why when he ate a steak, he was able to enjoy it. Because he knew that he may never eat one again, but if he did, he was going to enjoy it. If he enjoyed... Uh, uh, sleeping in the palace of, by, by some, in s someone who owned one that was a follower of Christ that loved Jesus and they had a lot of it. He can enjoy his time living and, and staying with people who had much. Or if he was out under the stars and he didn't have anything, he could enjoy that because he knew the author and perfecter of his faith, Jesus Christ, who though he was rich became poor that we might become rich. So I would just encourage you to just take his yoke upon you. Take his yoke upon you. Receive Christ as your savior. And for those of you who are struggling, and we recognize there are many in our culture, you think, oh, Brooks, I love Jesus and I've received him as my savior, but I have crushing debt and it's crushing me and Jesus isn't going to take care of my debt. That's partially true. He's probably not going to send you a hundred grand in the mail. 
But he has put you in a church that loves and cares for you, that has financial counselors that can walk with you and help you learn how to manage your finances in a way that they are not your God, but they are a tool and a resource so that you can become free. So I'd encourage you to go to our website, click on counseling, click on financial counseling, and get you plugged in. This is a very real thing. It's a very big problem in our culture. So it's unfair for me to preach this message and just say, go be content without recognizing that some of you are going to need some people to walk with you through that to learn how to be uh, financially good stewards and learn how to wean yourself off of the love of money. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the gospel and the freeness and your generosity in giving yourself to us the giver of all good gifts. Father, I pray for those who are struggling right now. I pray that you would encourage them in the faith. I pray, Father, for those who are are thinking about coming to you. I pray that you draw them to yourself, that they might trust you for their salvation. And Lord, for all of us, I pray, Lord, that you'd give us the gift of contentment, that we'd be content in you, the giver of all gifts. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless, go in grace. We'll see you next week.